It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. When the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, it arrived in the language of his place and time, Arabic. To this day, for virtually all Muslims, whether Arab or not, the Quran only truly exists in Arabic. You can read an English translation, sure, and there are many to choose from, but the Quran is said to defy translation. You've never read the Quran if you haven't read it in Arabic. In this episode, Bruce B. Lawrence of Duke University joins us to talk about his latest book, The Quran in English, a biography. It's part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious book series. We're also joined in this episode by Dr. David D. Peck from Brigham Young University, Idaho. Dr. Peck was a visiting scholar here at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute this summer. Bruce and David tell us all about the history of the English translation of one of the world's most renowned scriptures, the Quran in English. Is it possible to render God's words in human language? For Muslims, is it possible to do that in any other language than Arabic? Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. And don't forget to take a moment to rate and review the show on iTunes. We're joined today by Bruce B. Lawrence. He's the Nancy and Jeffrey Marcus Humanities Professor Emeritus of Religion at Duke University. And he's the author of a new book in Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious book series on the Quran in English. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Lawrence. Well, I'm glad to be here, and thank you for having this through the Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. I'm pleased and privileged to be on your program. Thank you very much. And we're also joined today by Dr. David D. Peck, and he's a visiting scholar here at the Maxwell Institute and also a professor of history at Brigham Young University, Idaho. He specializes in the history of the Middle East and Islamic civilization. Dr. Peck, thanks for being here with us. Thank you, and it's certainly a pleasure to be with uh, both you and Dr. Lawrence. I thought we'd begin by speaking with you, Bruce. It's been said that if you haven't read the Quran in Arabic, then you haven't really read the Quran. And in the introduction to your book, which is a biography of the English translation of the Quran, you write that there's always been hesitation, reluctance, and even resistance to translate the Quran. Can you explain that? Why is that? Sure. I think there there are many reasons, but the, the chief reason is that the Quran itself was revealed in Arabic. It says about itself um, that it is an Arabic Quran full of wisdom. And so there's a sense in which the privileging of Arabic as the language of revelation, which was there from the time of the prophet Muhammad in the early 7th century, pervaded all the transmission and reception and response to the the Quran in, in successive generations. And then there really developed, roughly from the 9th century on, a doctrine that in effect said, there's the superiority of the Quran, the, what's going on is the Ijaz al-Quran, that the Quran itself it cannot be rivaled in Arabic and also therefore cannot be rendered in any language other than Arabic. And that notion pervades not only among Muslims and throughout the Arabic-speaking Muslim world, but throughout all of the places in Africa and Asia, and of course now in Europe and North America, where there are Muslim communities. And the notion is that you have to know Arabic in order to understand the Quran, And of course, if you don't understand the Quran, you can't become a Muslim. And if you don't become a Muslim, you can't be saved. So as I say in in, in the introduction of my book, that you come up with a syllogism that says you have to know Arabic in order to be saved. And that really narrows the possibility for many of us. Um, I don't speak for myself. I've had the privilege of studying Arabic since, actually, since I was a teenager. and I'm now in my mid-70s. So I've been working at it. I won't say I know it, but I've been working at it for over half a century. But most people don't even have half a year or half a moment to think about Arabic, but they still wonder about their destiny, and they often have heard about Islam and heard about the Quran, but they want to have access to it in some language other than Arabic. So the question has been, can you as a non-Arab, and perhaps also a non-Arab, non-Muslim, make any sense of the Quran in the language other than Arabic? And the answer of orthodoxy, um, you correctly asked me, how do I put these two contradictions together, that, that the Quran is a universal message of revelation to all people, and yet there is the inside tag that says, if you don't know Arabic, you can't understand the Quran. If you don't understand the Quran, you can't become a Muslim, and you can't be saved. How do you reconcile those two? And what I try and do in my book, the Quran in English, is to explain how over centuries, really well over a, a, almost a millennium now, You've had people trying to render the Quran into other languages, Latin, German, French, and of course now English, and to make some sense of it, not only as a kind of commentary on the Arabic, but as a kind of parallel text. I, I hesitate to say coeval, 
That is to say that it's equal, the, the translation is equal to the original, but at least renders a sense of it that is elevated enough to attract someone to say, well, this message is one I want to read, I want to understand, I want to apply its message if I can to my own life. So my argument is that the, the Arabic Quran may be untranslatable in theory or in orthodoxy, but in practice, in history, it has been translated, it continues to be translated, and as I state towards the end of my book, there are ongoing endeavors that suggest by the middle of the current century, that is by the middle of the 21st century, we may have another 30 or 40 translations of the Quran into English beyond the 115 that we already have. So there has never been in the last few centuries any lack of effort to try and translate the Quran into different languages, including prominently English. But there remains the orthodox dictum, um, if you will, gatekeeping slogan that says, thou cannot translate this Quran, it's Arabic. If you don't know Arabic, you don't know the Quran. You don't know the Quran, you're not a Muslim. What are some of the reasons why people are driven to create a translation? And, and what are some drawbacks to translation that Orthodox Muslims are concerned about? There's that famous Italian saying of translator trader. Talk about some of the reasons people are driven to translate and some of the specific reasons why people resist the idea of translating this text. Yeah, it's wonderful, um, Blair, you cite this Italian dictum because it's so succinct that it, it almost is a ironic play on itself, tadutri taditri. So you almost have to be tongue-tied in order to say it, tadutri taditri literally means translator trader or anybody who translates is a trader. And as I explained at the beginning of my book, it means you're betraying two languages, the source language, because it can't be translated, but also the target language, uh, which will not have a full sense of the original meaning. So you're, you're betraying both the text you translate and the group to whom you're uh, hoping to address the translation. So all you can really have is a kind of mishmash, a kind of loose equivalence, but you can never have something that is a standalone text, which someone would read on its own without reference to the original. Now, you know, what has happened in terms of Islam is that many people have realized the importance of Islam as a, as a revealed religion and the community of Muslims worldwide from the 7th century on. Uh, most people know that Islam expanded from an Arabian source to across North Africa and across Asia. And, of course, it has become even more in the last couple of centuries a global religion that includes Europe and North America with significant Muslim communities. But there is this idea that if you translate, and I'll just take one example, which is often cited by Orthodox Muslims, the very word that is most resonant in Islam that pervades the Quran, that is, is there more than any other word, is the name of God, which is Allah, A-L-L-A-H. And so actually one of the major disagreements that exists till the present day is if you translate and you try to appropriate for another language the sense, the true deep, deepest level of meaning and resonance of the Quran, can you do it if you translate Allah as God? Now, one of the people I mentioned in my book, whom I argue is probably the most significant translator of the Holy Quran into English, is a man named Abdullah Yusuf Ali. And Abdullah Yusuf Ali was a British Muslim. He knew Arabic from the time he was very young, but obviously he also knew uh, Hindi Urdu, which is the language of South Asia, but he also knew English. And he was determined when he made his endeavor to translate the, the Quran into English, he said at the beginning, I want to make English itself into an Islamic language. And he quickly added, you cannot make English into an Islamic language unless you have an English equivalent to Allah, and that is God. So he, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, made the deliberate decision the first phrase that comes up in all 114 except one uh, of, of the chapters of the Quran is in the name of Allah, Bismillah. So he translates it in the name of God. When his translation became very popular and later towards the end of the 20th century, it was reproduced, reprinted from Saudi Arabia. The large hand of orthodoxy said there, it cannot be translated. The name Allah can't be translated, so they detranslated. It's an awkward word, an even worse process, but there is this term, detranslate, which means Yusuf Ali has said, in the name of God, for Bismillah, the Saudis rendered it as, in the name of Allah, 
and then went on with the rest. So I think in just that shift between Allah and God and then back from God to Allah, you have in microcosm the entire controversy about whether you can translate not only the Quran itself, but even the name of God from Arabic into English. David Peck, I also wanted to ask you, in addition to these type of questions about specific terms, like even the name of God, what else about the Quran makes it especially difficult to render into other languages? Let's see if you agree with this, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, well, I think one of the most difficult things about translating from Arabic is the fact that the nature of the language is different in its structure. Uh, for example, most of the nouns in Arabic are going to come from verbs. We often call them verbal nouns. So they're not going to have a noun like book. They're going to have a noun like a writing. Does that make sense? And so yeah. what happens is these nouns bring along with them a verbal sense. And so they, have, they can often have an active element to them that when you render them into English and you, and you simply say, uh, we're going to call this a book, uh, it's not really a book sounding in Arabic. It sounds like a writing. I think that would be one of the difficulties. Another one is poetry, because frankly, from my perspective, English is a relatively uh, weak poetic language in terms of rhyming. You have a number of limited rhymes, whereas in Arabic, you have an incredible richness of rhyming opportunity. And so it's, it's uh, difficult to render some of the poetic uh, sections to it. And, and certainly I would, I would at least point out those two, that the, the, the feel of the language, the flow of the language from its verbal origins uh, is one of, the, one of the most difficult ways of translating this book, as well as the poetry. The version of the Quran I read several years ago seemed very blocky, and it, it was so interesting for me to think about Muslims talking about the beauty of this text, because the way that this particular translation, and unfortunately, I, I don't remember which one it was, it was so blocky. It, there wasn't beauty there, and I, I imagine that a lot is lost for that reason alone. What, what would you say about that? I guess if I were to respond to that, the word uh, Quran itself in Arabic uh, refers to recitation. It refers to being recited rather than merely read with the eyes. And that aural component to the book is very, very important. And so uh, the notion is, is this is meant to have rhythm to it. It's meant to have a uh, poetic balance to it. It's meant to communicate on that level as well as the reading level. And so when you put it in English and you reduce this verbal notion to that blocky text, and then we don't read it out loud in a way that we, we pick up on the meter of the language and, and the beauty of the language that way, I, th I think that it's just a, an incredible challenge. It's going to sound, it, when you render it into English, you're gonna have a hard time making it sound like good English. <laughs> and Bruce Lawrence, you, you also had mentioned that most people in the world can't receive salvation through this Arabic text, they don't speak Arabic and so on, but also fewer than 20% of Muslims today are native speakers of Arabic. So what are the theological ways that Muslims would account for that gap, realizing that the Quran in Arabic is essential to their salvation in so many ways? How do they account for Muslims who don't speak Arabic? That's a great question. Let me let me address that after I do just a brief uh, follow-up to David's comment about the difficulty of rendering Quranic Arabic in any, any language, but especially in English. I, I, I want to just call attention to one of the people who recognize what David correctly said. It's not just getting the meaning, uh, the literal sense of what the word is in Arabic into some English equivalent. It's having this larger flow, this rhetorical sense, this rhythmical beauty of the Arabic, which is extraordinarily hard to render in English. And Arbery, one of the people I mentioned about midway through my book, who was a British Orientalist, if you will, who wrote a lot about Islam and translated both Persian and Arabic texts long before he took on the Quran. But at one point he just said, you know, I can't really stand it because, and, and this is a, a direct uh, quote from Arbery, he said, um, I need to make a translation because all of the others there's this, are characterized by a certain uniformity and dull monotony from the 17th century to the 20th. And I think David would agree with me, and you probably uh, also, Blair, in your reading, would find that in almost every rendering of the Quran, there is a certain uniformity and dull monotony that is not characteristic of a lively scriptural text. And so what Arbery tried to do, and of course he did it in Victorian English, which has its own limits, but he said what he wanted to do was to create or imitate in Victorian English, and this is a direct quote from Arbery, those rhetorical and rhythmical patterns which are the glory and the sublimity of the Quran. So if one can't attempt 
to render in something that listens, that one hears and listens to as glory and sublimity in English, you aren't going to have an echo, much less a happy rendering of, of the Quran. So the example I want to give, and this is what many, many people who are non-Arab Muslims seek to find, is when you say something like the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So I've just given you my first real phrase in Arabic. I mentioned Bismillah before, but the full phrase is, uh, and I know David recognizes this from his own work, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And many people say, well, that just proves your case. You can't get the Rahman and the Rahim, which is obviously an echo. Even my students, and I've had different kinds of students or, or general audiences, when I say Rahman and Rahim, they say it sounds like poetry. And I said, well, it is. It's not strictly poetry because the Prophet Muhammad was not a poet, but it has a lyrical flow that is characteristic of poetry. As Adonis once said, it's not prose, but it is prose. It's not poetry, but it is poetry when he was speaking about the Quran. It's a mixture of both, but the Rahman and Rahim is clearly lyrical. So I've worked for, I, I can't tell you how many hours, maybe days, thinking about this quandary that if one is going to translate, one has to begin with making sense in English in some kind of lyrical sense of Rahman and Rahim. And one of the ways I've come up with it, which has been applauded by some scholars and rejected by others and will still be debated forever, is instead of saying Rahman and Rahim in English, to say full of compassion, ever compassionate. So one uses the same word, compassion, twice, or if you will, full of mercy, ever merciful, but you echo in English the same word, which is the same word, of course, also in the Arabic, that Rahman and Rahim come from the same stem. And this is what David was saying, that you have to create a kind of flow that uses nouns with a, an echo, a sense of their verbal background. And if you don't do that, you're going to miss it. Now, for people who are non-Muslims, to answer your question about non, I'm sorry, non-Arab Muslims, the, the problem there, and I, I'm sure David's traveled in the Muslim world, I've spent a lot of my working life overseas, especially in Asia, and I have been to places where I've heard beautiful, beautiful recitations of the Holy Quran in Arabic. And at one point, I would stop somebody and say, can, can we go back over that phrase? Because it has many, many meanings. And the person would look at me and say, but I don't know what it means. I just know how to say it. So, th so there is the first instance of what happens because of the Arabic accent for orthodoxy is you have to learn the Quran in Arabic. But that, what the second part of that means, if you learn it in Arabic, reciting in Arabic is sufficient without knowing its meaning. And in my view, that also defeats the purpose of, of the revelation. Sure, you can say it. Sure, it sounds beautiful. But if you don't know what it means, even if you've memorized all 6,236 verses, all 114 chapters, have you really grasped the sense of revelation? And I just want to finish by saying I had a, a, probably one of the happiest moments in my whole teaching career is when I was teaching a course on the Quran, and there was a Muslim student who took it, and I, I asked him why, and he said, well, because I'm a Hafiz of Quran, that is, I memorized the Quran, but I don't know what it means. And he was honest about that. He said, listen, I can tell you, and, and I, I would pick up the Quran, any chapter, any part, and he could, res he could recite the whole rest of it or recite what was before it and after it. But it took him one semester of that course, and then we had a, su a, a subsequent independent study. And he said it wasn't until he really had thought about all the levels of meaning within the Quran that he began to understand it. And they looked at me puzzledly and said, but now I can't translate it. <laughs> So, so even even the with the best of intention, the highest principle of dedication to the text and to its authenticity, there still is a difficulty of getting from Arabic into some sense of English, but then some sense of English into what what Steiner calls uh, a reappropriation of its elevation of its high quality. And as David said, that's very very hard when you're dealing with poetry, and when you're dealing with poetry that's also scripture, it's even harder. Well, Bruce, you actually bring up something I think very important uh, in your book with regard to this that I think if you could address for us, it would help us. And that is, uh, in, in the book you referred to uh, Muhammad Assad's uh, translation, I think it's his 1980 edition, but where he says that he intends to, uh, I think this is a direct quote uh, from him, translate for, quote, the hearts and the minds of people raised in a different religious and psychological climate. And of course, the question that pops out to me is, 
which people does he think he's translating for and which psychological climate and and sort of to follow up on that yes having lived in the middle east in fact i remember during ramadan taking a taxi ride in cairo and the driver and i both reciting together al qadia oh yeah um the, that that particular surah and how much enjoyment and pleasure there was with the two of us reciting that together but that climate how how can a translation bring the climate of muhammad's day in translating to his earlier followers or how can it bring the climate of wherever you've been to the middle east or my experience with that taxi driver i wonder about that psychological climate if it can actually be translated or if the translator interposes themselves between the text and they decide what the psychological climate is and and rather than allowing or provide i don't know about allowing rather than facilitating the reader to discover the psychological climate for themselves. Well, I, I'm really glad you picked this up. It's, it's actually on page 80 of my book where I talk about this particular provision from Muhammad Assad. And I think I should say to people who are probably less well attuned to either the Quran or to the process of translation than, than you are, that, 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 that Muhammad Assad is one of four people whom I single out in, in my book as saying, if you want to understand how the Quran was translated. Once you grant that it it has to be translated despite the difficulties and that the real goal is to make a, a text that somehow is inviting in English while acknowledging that it will never equal the, the beauty or the soaring majesty of the Arabic, but still give a sense of the message, you have really four people. I start with this Maulana Muhammad Ali because everybody starts with him. You cannot avoid Maulana Muhammad Ali, his 1917 translation. But then you quickly move to Yusuf Ali and Muhammad, uh, Marmaduke, Marmaduke Pickthall, both of whom were excellent translators. And I've already mentioned Yusuf Ali. Marmaduke Pickthall is another fascinating a, a Britisher who became a convert to uh, Islam and then was supported by a Muslim ruler, the Nizam of Hyderabad, to do his own translation. And Pickthall's is, is in terms of forensic skill, that is burrowing down and thinking about the meaning of uh, verses and putting them in English is probably one of the best there is. But Muhammad Assad came from an even different route. He, he was an was a Austrian Jew in the 1920s, and he was very unhappy with what he thought was the very superficial, commercial, overly um, bland public life of most of, of the upper class to which he belonged in, in Europe in general, Austria in particular. And so he looked at different religions. He was a journalist. He looked at different religious traditions. And then he finally discovered that Islam was much more appealing to him and had a kind of on-the-train conversion where he picked up a copy of the Quran after he got home from a trip. And he suddenly saw this particular verse which s stood out for him, which said, you have to watch out what you do. You have to be sure that, that you don't go down to your grave only obsessed by greed. And for him, that's it. I'm going to become a Muslim, and he did. He he left his home, left his community, went off to Arabia, wound up marrying an Arab woman who became the mother of a man named Talal Assad, who's a famous anthropologist from New York. But the point is that all of his Jewish family were killed in the Holocaust, and ironically, this Jewish convert survived as a Muslim and then did this translation, which we know as the message of the Quran. So I think uh, I just gave that brief history of Muhammad Assad, David, to, re to remind everybody that in some sense, what Muhammad Assad is doing in his translation is telling you about his own journey and hoping other people can also come to the Quran and come to Islam, whatever their different religious or psychological climate. But his psychological climate was one where he definitely felt that he had to have a higher elevated religious, if you will, metaphysically transformative experience in order to continue his life. And the Quran was the basis for it. But again, he says, part of that quote that uh, goes on after what you quoted, he says, you can't do it without having an instinctive feel of the language. And he felt because he lived in Arabia, because he had an Arab wife, because he spent, what, 15 years of his life, the, at the end of his life in Granada, Spain, working on the Quran, that he had an instinctive feel of the language, and therefore he could g give people an idiomatic, an explanatory rendition that nobody else had ever done. And while I agree with him, I also want to point out what David said is absolutely true of Assad, is true of everybody else. Even when there are some places, and I think there are several, where Assad triumphs, that is where he, he adds meaning and value to the Quran in English, 
that nobody else before him has ever done or since him has done without him, despite that achievement, there's no poetry. There's nothing of those rhythmical, rhetorical features that Arbery lauded in the Quran and that he tried to reproduce. And I would just quickly say that Cleary, <clears throat> the one person I cite in my book who is extraordinary because um, unlike David, he couldn't uh, recognize Arabic uh, in a taxi cab in Egypt or anywhere else. But David Cleary <clears throat> is a brilliant translator, Thomas Cleary rather, is a brilliant translator who has produced religious classics from China, uh, the I Ching, uh, the Tao Te Ching, uh, and also studied the Lotus Sutras uh, and, and translated them into English. So he's a marvelous scholar of Far Eastern languages, but he realized the importance of the Quran and with an Arab, uh, an Arabic speaking um, partner, uh, assistant, he worked at first on a just little abridged thing called the Essential Quran, K-O-R-A-N. And then after that, he decided he would do the whole of the Quran and published his entire translation back in 2007. And it is poetry. Now, not everybody will like the poetry. Not everybody will say that it accurately reflects this distinct philological tradition of the Quran. I have known people who are agnostic and even atheist who've read uh, Thomas Cleary's translation of the Quran and said, it's an interesting book. I may have to read more. There may be something to this. And unfortunately, they would not have that same reaction to Muhammad Assad or even, uh, I think, to Abdullah Yusuf Ali unless they were really uh, interested in Islam before they picked up the book. So there's a certain sense in which the, the, the bravado, can I call it that? Some people say it's a foolhardiness uh, or some people would say it's a treachery. But whatever, it's the courage, certainly, of certain persons like Thomas Cleary um, who are not Muslim, do not know Arabic, but venture into the terrain of translating the Quran and come up with something that's been very useful and even productive for other people. That's Dr. Bruce B. Lawrence. We're talking with him today about his book, The Quran in English, a biography. It's part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Book Series. And we're also speaking with Dr. David D. Peck, a visiting scholar here at the Neely Maxwell Institute. So to put a bow around all of that discussion, I think one thing that your book will point out to readers, uh, Bruce Lawrence, is that many of these men who did, undertook these translations had a personal vested interest, at least in in some of the theology. And we'll get to that a little bit later on. But before we do, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the origins of the text. And I'll ask Dr. Peck here, what's in, in a quick nutshell, what's the traditional story about the origins of the Quran? And then how does that compare to what many scholars today believe about the text origins? Uh, yeah, I think it's a very important question. And and as I was reading the Bruce, the book, Bruce, which I really enjoyed, truly, uh, oh, oh, thank after you. we read the first, oh, uh, yeah, I think you've done a great job. After I read the, uh, the account of Revelation to Muhammad, just uh, from my own experience, I expected the next section of the book to answer the question, what exactly is it that translators think they're translating? In other words, what's the source text? And I know that, that that's, that's largely absent from your, your book, and I was curious as to the story behind that, but, but in getting to that, it seems to me that there's a lot of academic debate that's been going on for oh, decades that I, I know you're aware of that talks about what is this book, where did it come from? It couldn't have come in 25 or 50 years. You know all these arguments. But the, the notion is uh, the history of this text. I, I wonder, first of all, why you chose to not go through that. We don't seem to know how the book was, for, or at least there's debate over how it was put together. And there are variant texts of the Quran, as you know, that are used by some sects of Islam, etc. So what could you tell us about the origin of this text what, and the effect of the history of its origin on English translations? Well, David, thank you for that very thoughtful and uh, also probing question. And um, actually, when I was doing this book, I, I must confess I had a longer section on how the Quran itself was created. I also had a longer section on the complicated biography of the Prophet Muhammad, which is more than just the traditional or the commonplace uh, story that people would know from the early sources in, in Islamic history. So w after I'd done this, my, my editor got back to me and said, you know, this is great for a scholarly audience. Why don't you put that in a footnote and tell us the, real, the, 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 the simple story or the straightforward story about both the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran so we can get to translation? 
In other words, I was vetoed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I would disagree with your editor, but uh, I'm glad that well, uh, at least it made it to a footnote. Well, no, but I want to tell you that, that this footnote, when I, even crafting a footnote, the reason why your question just you know goes to the heart of who I am as not just a person who is devoted to Scripture and engaged by the Quran, but also uh, a card-carrying historian, you know, I wanted to be able to say, Listen, like everything historical, it has it has a context. The text has a context. And so I said, um, there's a lively debate. It's been going on for more than a decade about the critical text of the Quran. The Uthmanic Codex, as you know, it's called the Uthmanic Codex, go, goes to 634. And then, of course, El Azhar in 1924 approved what it called the standard edition of the Arabic Quran. But as um, I quote several people, but I, I think this is, this one person, I think, said it better than I could paraphrase. So let me just quote Timothy Conway. The formation of a standard single text of the Quran seems to be much more complicated than the traditional Muslim account, which maintains that the text was fixed during the caliphate of Uthman. And I go on to say that this polite skepticism is confirmed in what I think to be the best source uh, I've, I've read lots of things, but I think the best source that I've read on on this whole question comes from a, a French scholar, Francois de Roche, which is titled Qurans of the Umayyads, published in 2013, where he goes through and shows how there were compromises made in order to come up with what was the standard text. So obviously there were variations, and he quickly adds, in terms of a text as complex as the Quran, with, you know, as you know, 114 chapters, 634 verses, 6,634 verses, is, is, it's not a question of of how many chapters were learned, but, but how many of readings that were, of course, not standardized until the end of the 7th century, how many of these could be done differently, and what does that mean both philologically and theologically if you have different readings? And so I have thought about this issue. I've had debates with people. When I did my earlier book, you may know I did a book back in 2005 called the Quran biography, and I had a slight section on different textual editions of, of, of the Quran that differ from the Uthmanic Codex. And several people said, oh, why didn't you have a whole chapter on that? And again, what I would say uh, to you, David, and also to Blair, is that I think there is a lot of room for debate, and there can be lots of questions raised. I think what, what one comes back to, and let me just give the most skeptical uh, version, which comes back actually to the 7th century into somebody I know David knows called Ibn Mas'ud. So Ibn Mas'ud was a companion of the Prophet Muhammad, was one of the early ones who heard the Quran when it was spoken, that is, before it was committed to writing, and himself was devoted to making sure that the Quran was accurately transmitted. Ibn Mas'ud said two things that most Muslims would reject outright. First of all, he said Surah Al-Fatiha, which is the first of, of the chapters, is more like a... Um, a preface instead of the first chapter, that actually the, that the Surah Al-Baqarah is what really begins the Quran, that, that Fatah is kind of like a, a preface or an overview, but not part of the actual Quran, whereas the second, but the, the last two surahs or chapters, the Mu'awad the Thain, that the Mu'awad the Thain are really apotropaic or uh, healing verses that were said in different occasions and they were put together as verses and then as chapters that reflect a kind of, um, if you will, handbook of healing for the Quran, but are not part of its essential message. So the essential message of the Quran goes from Surah Al-Baqarah to Surah Al-Ikhlas. And if one thinks about this theologically, it makes a lot of sense that the coherent message of the Quran is really between the second chapter and the 112th, with a kind of preface called Fatiha and a kind of appendix uh, called the uh, Apotropaic or Mu'adhatain verses. I think to translate this for an LDS audience, Latter-day Saint audience, I would say this would sort of be like if centuries from now, Mormons were debating whether or not the chapter headings in the Book of Mormon were part of the original or, or maintained the same scriptural status as the text of Joseph Smith's translations or something like that. So this, this really comes down to debates about the purity of the Quran and the correct... Uh, the correct interpretation of the, the Quran. And so this becomes a really contentious issue. This fact of, is the Quran, has it been transmitted through the centuries in Arabic just as Muhammad received and recited it? Or has there been corruption to the text, additions to the text, and things like this? And there are also theological ramifications for this. Dr. Peck, I know you have an example of that where there are different translations of 
I'm thinking of Surah 7, 172 as an example of that. Yeah, uh, I think we can get to that. I just want to make one last uh, comment before we go on, and that is it seems to me that the question of how the Quran was formed, for me, actually raises the question of the Quran being first translated into Arabic, if you will. In other words, in those early periods, what they're really doing, it seems to me, at times is translating whatever they've received into some kind of Arabic that's being, the alphabet's being created, etc. And so the question then becomes, aren't we even translating a translation of a translation? So like the canonization process. The is canonization process itself, the, the addition is, uh, most people won't know that, uh, Ar- listeners may not know that Arabic doesn't have its short voweling. It doesn't mark them, uh, and so it, it marks the long vowels. But later on, uh, these diacritical marks that give the short vowels were added Added in there, but, How you pronounce but they were not stuff, in the original yeah. text, and the the ones you choose to use can change the the meaning of, of the text itself, sometimes uh, rather dramatically. But uh, so that was my point about maybe a history of the text itself is important to understand. Uh, maybe the the purity of the Quran that uh, that is being worried about isn't. Uh, uh, it has its own issues, but it, I'll move on then to um, what I was talk, talking about or what you were talking about was Surah 7, uh, Surah uh, Arafah, uh, verse 172. And, and it's in particular an example from Assad, who I respect deeply, by the way. I'm not, this is not a, meant to be disrespectful, but in this particular verse, a perfect ten, tense is used. As you know, Arabic doesn't have tenses in the same way English does, but the, the the actual verse is in the perfect or a completed past effort, and yet when I come to Assad, he he insists almost on on giving it a present a present tense in English uh, meaning. So can I go on? Can I just mention in a little more detail what I'm talking about? Sure. Yeah. So before we go on, so if I were to look, let's say um, at, at another translation, uh, it, it would say, and I and I'm kind of cheating in a sense because i'm using the study quran which came out after i think your book was already well underway yeah but i but i i note that uh, just to, to paraphrase what you're going to say uh, that that of all the texts that i have which are, uh, and of course they're based mostly on pickthal the study quran Correct. it has the largest commentary of almost two and a half pages on just this one verse Yes, that's correct. In fact, that's what I'm looking at uh, in my particular edition of the book. Yep, yeah, and yeah, this is the and study, Quran. We've done, and people that have listened to the podcast, have, uh, we've spoke with the editors of this as well, so people can go back and listen to that oh, that's good. for more background. But yeah, go I ahead. I encourage them to do that. Yeah. I think it's going, to, and you may agree, Bruce, it's, it's, it's going to become a very important work, at least for, for academics in English. Uh, so that one says, and when thy Lord took from the children of Adam, from their loins, their progeny, and made them bear witness concerning themselves. Alas to be rabbikum, right? Am I not your Lord? They said, yea, we bear witness. Allah, Allah yep, yep. shahidna. Yep, yep, that's right. And so uh, this whole kalu bala shahidna, all of that, kalu bala shahidna, and all the alas to be rabbikum, all of that is in that perfect tense. So it's when thy Lord took. But, it, but when we go to the Muhammad Assad translation, and here's what he says of the same verse. And whenever thy sustainer brings forth their offspring from the loins of the children of Adam, he thus calls, and that thus is in brackets, as you know, thus calls upon them to bear witness about themselves. Alas, to be am I not your sustainer? To which they answer, Kalu bala shahidna. Yea, indeed, we do bear witness thereto. And so, it brings forth their offspring from the loins of the children of Adam, which tend, it talks about birth, right? It's saying, so, so the one is talking about uh, a completed action he took, and this uses the, the phrase brings forth their offspring. It seems to me, my first point about that, it seems to me that it's sort of a, a complete departure from the clear Arabic. And so in, in fairness to Asa, because the clear Arabic, it seems to me, is perfect. It's not an ongoing action. It's not an incomplete action. But when we look at Muhammad Assad's footnote to that, he acknowledges that. He says, in the original, this passage is in the, the past tense. Mm-hmm. Uh, parentheses, quote, he brought forth, he asked them, etc. Thus stressing the continuous recurrence of 
of the above metaphorical question and answer a continuity which is more clearly brought out in the translation by the use of the present tense. Now, first of all, that doesn't even make any sense to me. I, I have to I have to admit that saying it's clearly it's clearly the past tense, and that means there's some kind of continuous recurrence. And then he goes to the present tense. I, doesn't that reflect his probable view that this was not a primordial event, this was not a pre-birth event? Because as you know, many commentators take it literally to say everybody was there, everybody was asked by God, uh, by Allah at the same time, uh, am I not your Lord? So and this that is like everybody a took a covenant, but that Assad agrees with those commentators who don't believe that, and therefore is actually translated the perfect, you know, this Mahdi, he's translated the perfect tense of the Arabic intentionally into an imperfect English. Is that accurate? And if it is, how often do you find or do you find translators frequently choosing English that interposes their interpretation of the Quran onto the language in ways that the language itself may only questionably support or not support at all. Well, David, I really, I really applaud your your um, exegetical fervor in looking so closely at, at at this text and at the language of it. And, I, and I'm certainly glad that um, Blair told me you were going to talk about this because I brought sitting before me four or five different translations, and you're absolutely right that none of them, and I could cite who they are, but it would take up beyond the time we've got. <laughs> But none of them transfer the tense from the perfect, which is in the Arabic, uh, to the present, which is Assad. But your your intuition or your insight about why Assad did it is absolutely right, that in every instance of the Quran, where there's something that has a kind of metaphysical aura of, 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 of magic or of a kind of a layering of worlds of the unknown, of al ghaib which is a phrase, as you know, used in the Quran a lot for what's not known, for human beings, he, he tries to render into something that can be more palpable, uh, to use a term that other people like to say. He's, he's much more somebody who's aligned to a kind of rationalist way of trying to explain things as if it was a human progeny rather than a divine act. So I think your, your critique of, of, of Assad is correct. Your uh, claim that he also has shifted the Arabic from perfect to present is true. And I'm, as I said, I'm looking at five different translations other than Assad. Nobody else does this. But where some of them really get caught up, and I think almost equally important for your project, and, and I would guess, you know, um, for, for uh, others' interpretation of the Quran, is that the Anfusihim, which is really the, the, the key phrase here, Ashadu Hamana Anfusihim, is they look at themselves or are they, or are they look at their souls? And there is one translation I have in front of me, by, it happens to be by Ahmed Zaki Hamad, a very well-known translator. He says, your Lord took from the children of Adam from their law all the souls that would become their posterity, and he made them bear witness to their own souls. Yes. So this is much stronger than themselves. Yes. This is actually giving you know some substance to the soul as an element that is apart from the body and predominates in and through it. So I think the accent on Anfusihim, which, of course, you do not have in Assad, Assad, and like many others, uh, just says, oh, they bear witness about themselves. But it's actually Anfusihim, which can be and often is, as you know, in Arabic, nefs, Anfus is self, but it's also soul. So there's a large theological issue lodged in here. You're right about the change in tense, but also in the choice of words for how you translate the noun and Anfusihim. Oh, I think you're... I would agree with that too. You know, I do a lot of work on Sufism, and Sufis that I that I would deal with when I bring up this particular verse, to almost a person will say souls. Yeah. And then they will they will also say our souls are very old. I have a dear friend that would say uh, we're we're at least twenty thousand years old, or <laughs> we're you know because what they do is they say we were souls when this happened and and not only that but they'll go on further and say when they said shahidna uh, not only concerning themselves but that that they sort of held or offered we offered they would say our souls as collateral against the trust that we pledged to god when he said we will hold him as our our lord yeah. so th i think there is an intense theology as you say there and i appreciate you bringing that up well it's beautiful so to break all that down this is an interesting issue especially to latter-day saint listeners because what this boils down to is 
there are some Muslims who believe in some kind of pre-mortal or primordial existence for human souls, which would resonate with the Latter-day Saint audience who has a similar, uh, a similar theological view. Yes, I think I think you're absolutely correct, and not only that, but uh, that the premortal or primordial uh, experience was universal for all humankind, which I think Latter-day Saints would say that everybody who showed up here on Earth, uh, quote unquote, agreed to the plan presented by the Father, and that's like very much like this idea of Allah saying to all the souls. It, it, accept me as your Lord. It's a pledge. It's a covenant. It's a relationship. And, and, yeah, and so not only the the fact of a primordial existence, but the the fact of a primordial existence in which everybody we see on this planet is bound by primordial covenant to God Himself. David, is is that a, is that a common belief in the Islamic world, or is that you'd, you'd find you'd be pretty hard pressed to find someone who's familiar with that? Because it seems kind of the belief in primordial existence of some sort, you know, being taken from the loins of Adam or, or uh, and being presented before God in some primordial state, at least pre-birth state, we might want be able to call it that, is found in Islam in many places, but it is not found universally in Islam. Uh, but I found it among uh, Sunni scholars that I've interviewed. I found it among Shi'i scholars I've interviewed, and for Sufis, it's almost a uh, it's almost an article of faith. In fact, in in almost every Sufi text that deals with the anthropology of Islam, what happens to humans as they move through uh, this sort of pre-birth experience, etc., on to an eternal destination, either paradise or hell. Almost to a person, Sufis will start with this primordial covenant. In fact, they call it Yom Alast, the day of "Am I not? Am mm. I not your yeah. Lord?" So, mm. cool. And I just, I just want to add to what David said. He said it beautifully. I just want to add that the person who is embody this, and uh, I've often been at funerals where people will recite um, the poem of Rumi, where he talks about. Uh, birth and rebirth and it really goes from being a plant to being an animal to being a human to being an angel and and you know when have I ever been less by death every every death brings a, 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 a higher elevation to where I experience the eternity of my soul so I mean Rumi himself you know the whirling dervish the embodiment of the 13th century hope for poetry and and, and pluralism in Islam uh, also uh, expounds the same view that David just did, that this, the soul is transient and it keeps moving up. That's Bruce Lawrence. He's the author of the Quran in English, a biography. We're speaking with him today and Dr. David Peck, a visiting scholar here at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. I wanted to ask Dr. Peck about some of the political ramifications of English Quran translations and then have uh, have Bruce Lawrence expand on this. So Dr. Peck, one of the things that Bruce points out in his book is that Saudis have kind of come to rule English Quran translations. If you encounter an English Quran translation, some of these kind of inexpensive paperback copies that get passed around, chances are uh, that it's kind of come through the Saudis. What does that suggest about these, uh, about the state of the English Quran today, uh, politically? What, what are the implications there? Just to first of all say that I thought that Bruce did an excellent job of, in very few words, covering the basics of this very complex question. But if I were to summarize it, it would be that, uh, first of all, Saudi Arabia has been for quite some time purposefully uh, expanding with a, with a missionary zeal uh, its interpretations of Islam, uh, often referred to as Wahhabism, uh, part of what's called the Salafi movement, which I, in a second, would like Bruce to address what the significance of that is, because I think in the book it's mentioned, but I don't know that readers will know the significance of what was said about it's that in the book. book. It's a, it is a short book, and it's a well-written book. I highly recommend this book, and I'm going to use it with my own students. But, but uh, so in, in looking at this, though, let me, let me begin by saying it seems to me that, that what happened is the Saudi Arabian government uh, realized some time ago, several days, decades ago, that they could sort of take control of the English language dissemination of the Quran, at least 
assert themselves. I don't know if take control is too strong, but really assert themselves in the English-speaking Quran. And they did this in several ways. They formed the King Fahd Institute, which would manage translation of the Quran, not only in English, but other languages, as Bruce mentions in his book. There's a photo of it in there, too, I think. Yes, right? I, yeah. yes there is a photo of the institution. Yeah. It has a, a huge Quran as yeah. a statue in front of it. And um, at any rate, this, this institute began with uh, the Yusuf Ali translation uh, because it had gone out of copyright this uh, this translation by a South Asian who who it's fairly uh, liberal and rationalistic yeah too, right? very like, liberal rationalistic funny. yeah this, this is a fellow who's who's going to be quite different in many yeah. respects from the Saudis so it seems like the the first but a very popular English translation yes. and so maybe the first way in which this is co-opted is by getting hold of that translation and changing it in ways which would fit what uh, the Saudi message what the message they wanted to send to the English speaking world and then uh, eventually they came upon their own their own translation which is covered very well in the book and uh, th this is the Han Halali uh, translation and this that particular translation I think uh, fits very well with with, uh, with this sort of Wahhabi message that they, this Hanbali Wahhabi Salafi message that they want to to inculcate in the minds and the hearts of Muslims whose primary language is English, as well as others who read the book. And but I thought what uh, Wait, what would what, two or three key points of that theology be like? What's what are the key points that they're trying to well there, control? Uh, there's going to be a literalism given to many passages of it and so I think that one of the one of the ways in which they're going to look at this is a very fundamentalist sort of way um, uh, let, me, let me just add David yeah. not, not only not only fundamentalist but but also unitive that is to say that there's only one tr interpretation there can't be multiple there's only a single translation and interpretation is possible absolutely yeah and I think that that's I think it's a very important one but the one I wanted I would like to, to hear you address Bruce is this um, the uh, Peachy? Um, trying to remember Johani. the name. Johanni, yeah, the Peachy Johanni translation. Which, I mean, what was the process whereby the King Fahd Institute got control of that? You do touch on it in the book, and do you view that as a sort of an eff effort to silence an alternative translation? Oh, yeah. in other words, did they obtain the copyright so that they could suppress it? Because you say you had to write the author to get a copy of it. You can't get a copy of that translation. Well, well let me just say that I, although I think I'm fairly diligent as a scholar and I try and track down every lead, I had not even heard of Jahani Pichi, but a good friend of mine whom I mentioned also in the book who's not done his own complete translation of the Quran, but I really commend him for his effort to make the rhythm, but David uh, knows full well, and, and I've also tried to emphasize it, that you, you can't just translate the meaning, you have to have the flow, you have to have the passion, you have to have the lilt of poetry if you're going to speak, not just read the Quran in English. So one of the people who's recognized this and agrees with me, who happens to be a devout Muslim, I won't say I'm a devout non-Muslim, but I'm not a Muslim, uh, and, and, and so this fellow who's a devout Muslim, uh, Shaukat Turawa, T-O-O-R-A-W-A. -A. Uh, Shalkut uh, got in touch and he said, Bruce, you know, there's another Saudi translation. You've got to get hold of it. And he told me who it was, you know, and, and Dave is quite correct. It's it's Daoud Pichi, a, a, a English American, rather, convert to, to Islam. And then um, Manad al-Johani, who's an, a, a Saudi Arab, obviously Sunni Muslim. And I tried to get hold of it, and I couldn't get hold of it, and I wrote back to Shaukat and said, you know, I can't find this thing anywhere. You, you told me about it, but I, I, I don't get it. He said, well, gee, you're in luck because the, uh, the author gave me his address, so maybe you could write him. So I wrote him. I actually wrote Peachy, because Johanni died. You may recall Johanni had a car accident and died back in 2000. So I, I wrote Peachy, and he sent me his own copy, and that's the only way I got it. I couldn't, I couldn't get it online. There's no Amazon.com thing for it. So I, I thought, gosh, this must be a really, you know, just a rudimentary. It is a polished translation. These guys worked for two decades uh, to make what they call a, a, an accessible, clear translation. But they made two mistakes. First of all is they translated Allah into God. Mm. And the second thing, we haven't talked about this, is the word Islam, uh, D David mentioned earlier, made a very pivotal point about the fact that everything in Arabic comes from a verbal stem, a verbal flow. So Islam literally is the name of a religion, but it also means the act of surrender. And a Muslim is one who 
participates in that act of surrender. But it had meaning long before Islam came into being. There were Islams before Islam, and there were Muslims before Muslims. So what they do, that is Pichi and Johanna, everywhere that it refers to Moses or refers to Jesus or a previous group, they talk about Islam with a small I or Muslim with a small M, or they just say someone who surrenders. And for the Saudis, that's heresy, because every time Islam comes up in the Quran, it has to be capitalized. Every time there's Muslim, it has to be capital M. So on both counts, because Allah was translated and because Islam was not untranslated, was not left as Islam, instead translated as surrender, they faulted it. They, they, they refused it to, to uh, disseminate it. They allowed it to be published, but they, then they didn't disseminate it. So it's, it's, it's similar to sort of saying, this is a dead-end book. Its, its shelf life is over even before it started. And so I, I actually, just to, to follow up on this one story, since uh, I appreciate David having picked it out of the pages of my book, I actually went to Turkey. I had to go to Turkey for something else. I made a point of going to see Dawood Pichi, who now lives in Turkey and teaches there. And I went and had a whole evening conversation with him, a very nice man, very gentle, very devout, but also very sad because this translation of his with, on which he'd worked so hard and which w w was published from uh, Saudi Arabia, from Jidda, uh, was not disseminated. And so it left him trying to hope that maybe he could find a Turkish publisher to make the English version of it available to others. But that's that I think there are two sides to Saudi censorship. The one that David correctly mentioned is to have sponsored, first of all, Yusuf Ali and then their own independent translation by Khan Hilali. But the other side of that is to censor or suppress even translations, not just by other people they don't like, but even by their own scholars whose outcome or product they don't like. So I think I think it's a very heavy hand of, of, of censorship. I regret it. I think everybody has to understand it. And I think even some Saudis, and I must quickly add, I know some Saudis who also feel this is, a, this is not a uh, protective, but a really uh, detrimental activity that is gauged by, by Saudi religious affairs. And there are some Saudis, and I want to say this very strongly, who passionately would like to see more openness and greater variety to Quran translation. I think that's wonderful. If I could just interject one small thing then to follow up and from my perspective conclude this. You mentioned Salafi in there and, and I, I don't know if a lot of our readers understand the influence of the Salafi movement with uh, ISIS or Al-Qaeda and uh, might say Boko Haram or others. In other words, Salafism, if you could take just a, a moment and say how might Saudi control of the English translations of this text advance the Salafi concept of fundamentalism and the reestablishment of a, a seventh century caliphate? Well, I think I could give many examples, but I just think that one that is most painful but also pervasive for me in, in my own experience is I, <clears throat> I've done a lot of what's called prison ministry. I mean, I've, I've visited people who are in prison uh, because I feel they're still very much a part of the larger human enterprise and they maybe are more needy than some of the rest of us who aren't physically in prison. So um, in doing that prison ministry, I've often come across uh, Muslims, and uh, quite a few of them are Muslims who read the Quran that's available, made available in prisons. And to my dismay, uh, I found that in many, not all, but in many instances, the Quran that was available was the Khan Hilali, the one that is provided free of charge. And we didn't mention this, but one of the reasons why the Saudi... Uh, ministry is, is so effective is that their Qurans are distributed free of charge, like Gideon Bibles, you know, they're, they're delivered to hotels free of charge. So this idea that you can just have a Quran free of charge seems like a great boon, except when you read it. And when you read the first, the very first chapter, the Fatih, we've talked, David and I've talked a little bit about the Fatih, the opening chapter of the Quran. When you read the opening chapter of the Quran, which simply says at the end, at the end of his very short, just seven verses, it says, uh, those um, on whom God is not angry and who have not gone astray. In the Khan Hilali, it says, those who God is not angry, the Jews, and have not gone astray, the Christians. Well, they've interpolated what is there in some commentaries, but not all commentaries, and not, I would say, not mainstream commentaries. But there is this kind of dissident view that says that the revelation given to the Prophet Muhammad that became the Fatiha was referring to Jews when it said, those 
who, on whom God's angry, and when it says those who've gone astray, it's referring to Christians. As many people, including Tabari, who's a very famous 9th century Mufasir or commentator on the Quran, what he said, this would be completely anachronistic because when the Fatih was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, there were Jews and Christians among his listeners. Absolutely. Why would he exclude them before they're even uh, exposed to the Muslim message? So it's an anachronistic way of claiming that every time the Quran talks about people who God's angry at, it's Jews, and every time people gone astray, it's Christians. And yet it is inserted, not as in a commentary, but inserted as part of the text. And readers wouldn't even know. It just seems like that's what the Quran says. These editions aren't making yeah. it clear that these are interpolations. So, so I, I think that's very damaging. I think it's very dishonest. I think it's, it's, it's not uh, accurate to say that, that the Quran in, in its revealed form had those uh, interpolations. And it also is very damaging because it suggests that Muslims have as perpetual enemies both Jews and Christians because they're, first of all, God's enemies. That's Bruce B. Lawrence. He's an emeritus professor of religion at Duke University, and he's the author of The Quran in English, a biography. It's part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Book series. To wind down, I wanted to talk about the last chapter in the book, uh, Bruce. Your concluding chapter focuses on the graphic Quran. Graphic novels are really popular right now. These are these illustrated books. They're kind of like comic books, but they're more complicated than that, or kind of an illustrated... Uh, book and this last chapter that you wrote was actually enough to entice David Peck into buying a copy of that graphic Quran. He wanted to check that out. So tell us a little bit, uh, a brief history of like what is this graphic Quran? Well, I mentioned to you before that that uh, part of my research is to listen, uh, listen to my friends, listen to people who know more than I do, and when I can, try to follow their advice. So I had finished my book. I had finished at least the what I thought was the the final draft of what was going to become this book for Princeton University Press. I've been working on it for over four years. And again, a friend of mine got in touch and said, well, you know, before you send off your manuscript, you might want to take a look at this new book that is coming out by an artist. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm not dealing with art. I'm dealing with translation. He said, well, actually, it's kind of translation and art sort of mingled together. And I just, I just couldn't imagine because I know David has seen illustrated uh, Qurans, but the Qurans are illustrated with border designs, especially Surat al-Fatiha, and then some places in between you have uh, illuminated borders. But artistic work in the Quran is not something that I have ever seen. So I hesitated and finally postponed submitting my final manuscript to Princeton until I got a copy of this incredible book, really incredible piece of work called American Quran by Sandow Birk. And I, I have to just say to you, I, I spent two weeks simply mesmerized. I didn't do anything else. My wife wondered why I lost my appetite. I said, yeah, I, I think I, the only thing I can do is to absorb what is the message of this this big coffee table size book called American Quran. And what it, what it really was is he's, he's an artist who was influenced by 9-11 and then the Iraq war that followed in March 2003. And he wanted to see if all Muslims were really as evil as the ilk that perpetuated 9-11 and that continued under al-Qaeda with Osama bin Laden. And he traveled around the world. He was also a typical Californian artist. He was a skateboarder and a surfboarder, and he went around different places where he could he could not only pursue his art, but also have uh, some fun calisthenics on the side. And so he found in one place in Ireland, he found this wonderful Chester Beatty library. If you've never been there or never have a chance to go to Ireland and Dublin, I urge you to go to Chester Beatty. Wonderful copies of, of the Bible, um, Celtic versions of, of, of the Bible. But there also are ancient Mamluk manuscripts of the Quran, many of which are written and then smudged out because somebody makes an error. They smudge it out and rewrite it. And he suddenly thought, gee, I can do that. I know I'm not perfect. I certainly don't know anything like the Arabic in the Quran, but I can sort of copy a good translation. And then he had the challenge of finding a good translation. And curiously enough, the one he liked was Assad, but he didn't feel that he could get copyright for it. So he, he picked another one by a fellow named Rodwell, who was a 19th century British translating the Quran. And so he, he, he used Rodwell with some interpolation from Assad, but also Cleary, the other guy I mentioned who is the Buddhist poet who has translated the Quran into English. And between Assad and Cleary, using Rodwell as the base, he transcribed all 6,346 uh, verses of the Quran and then did borderline designs that illustrated different aspects of American life and published it as American Quran. And I think it is a bold, beautiful, beautiful, 
Unfortunately, weighty book. When I say weighty, it's very heavy. It's not just in its tone. Its tone is quite wonderful and, and uplifting, but it is 15 pounds, more than you can carry on your bike or <laughs> you know move around from place to place. But if one explores it and sees how he depicts a certain verse, because you can't do everything from the Quran, as David knows well from having studied and taught it, but he picks a certain verse, a certain message from a particular verse, and then illustrates that on the border. And I found that he did this with great skill and did it in such a way that made you look from the image to the text and back to the image and gave a fuller meaning to the Quran than you have with simply a literary translation, even one that comes closest, but not a quite achieving the, the level of aesthetic excellence that you have in the Arabic Quran. So I thought Sandal Birk, American Quran, was closest to being a, a graphic Quran, and I ended my book by talking about him and hoping that this kind of boldness, which was done with reverence, because he... he he himself is, he described himself as a non-believer. I think he's more an agnostic than an atheist, but he's certainly not a Muslim. He's probably not even a practicing Christian of any sort, but he's a very devout artist. And I thought the product that he produced, this wonderfully illustrated American Quran, is worthy of being included in a book on the Quran in English. Oh, I thought you did a beautiful job with including it too. Uh, I have a couple of points that I would like to hear your response to. One of them is, uh, as, you, as the, the listeners may not know, but the titles of the chapters or the surahs of the Quran are often taken from a phrase within the Quran or, or some particular set of words that are in that surah. And so the name of it comes from within it. And I thought it was fascinating that he chose to not name a surah, so to speak, after that, but he chose to illustrate the surah by finding uh, the work that was in there. And so I, I felt that he was doing something uh, absolutely ingenious that was in the spirit of the Quran. And I would like to hear you comment on that and then just a couple of other things. I think he used the word adapt, not translate, but he had an adaptation of the Quran. Is that? That's right. Uh, at any rate, I think, yeah, he used that. And, and I was just going to ask you if you could comment on the relationship between a book and a reader, because I think this illustrated Quran really shows that he has adapted the message of the Quran to his life, to his world, to his culture, and he's made it relevant to himself and hopefully by extension to to many, many others, including Americans. So those two points, I guess, the first one is, you know, comment maybe on how he might have captured the spirit of, instead of naming a surah, of drawing a surah from the language itself, and this idea of adaptation and personalization that marries a book to a reader in a way that relates to their life. It may even relate to their existence. Well, my first comment is, I hope that there are many readers of both my book and Burke's book who uh, have the same attention to detail and reflection that you have, because uh, you've just described it, you know, in ways that um, leave me shivering on the other side of the phone here, uh, because you've done it so so eloquently and with such careful choice of words. So I want to say that, yes, this is definitely what I call a robust use of artistry in the service of making the Quranic message clearer. And you're absolutely right. The the images are picked from a, a single verse in a way that the Quran itself doesn't do, but which it lends itself to, to doing. And I thought the example that of Surah Yasin, the, the 36th chapter, which for many people is the heart of the Quran, was to me one of the most graphic examples where he he did this uh, beautifully on both counts, picking the, the name Yasin, which is just two letters from the beginning of it, and doing, and this is where Assad, who I quite cor quite correctly got his tense wrong when he was uh, doing seven one seventy two, but I think he got his philology right when he did Yasin and said Yasin could be actually uh, a diminutive for all human being, and so he actually translated. You remember uh, uh, Muhammad Assad translates Quran. 36, not simply as Yassin, but as O oh, human being, or, or, or O oh, thou human being. And what Birk does is to pick up the title and then leave out the thou, the, 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 the uh, second uh, singular pronoun. He, so he just says, O oh, human being. And then he goes on to illustrate it with this kind of wonderfully evocative image of, which it says on, on one half there, when you get down to the 33rd verse, it says, right before them, this is from the Quran translated in English, Right before them is the dead earth. We have, we make it produce the grain they eat. So it's a very vivid image. 
of the earth is dead and then grain coming up. And what he has done is to put in the circle in the border around this particular opening two pages of Surya Yasin, or human being, a kind of Nebraska or Iowa farm field where you have the tractor on one side and you see the side on the other. And it's all done in evocative colors that are both green and brown, and the sky is light blue with the, with the clouds seeming to pick up the verses and, 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 and lift them skyward or, or let them drop down from the sky to earth, whichever way you want to go. But it's a beautiful way of sort of epitomizing one verse, admittedly only one from this very strong, uh, I should say this is not only a strong chapter, but um, if you've been to Muslim funerals, and I've, of course, been to a few, and I'm sure David has, this is always recited. This is always recited, so it's, a, it's, a, it's not only just another chapter or a set of verses from the Quran, it's a powerful one that is liturgically woven into the life and also the death of most Muslims. So to have this image of the dead earth and then having it come to life through the grain that people eat, I thought it was just a wonderfully involved, complex, uh, but also evocative use of the Quran, both in, in replicating the graffiti uh, verses, in, verses that he's all copied out. He copied out all 6,346 of them, but also here doing this border, which beautifully etches a farm field in America to illustrate a point from 7th century Arabia. It's beautiful. No? Uh, 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 and so he's showing us again that maybe translation isn't enough, that the reader should adapt the, the, the power of the Quran, the power of a, of a holy book, might be not so much even in its original text, not so much even in its translation, but in its adaptation and its application. And so if you, you know, that's that's my view of that. And, and I, I don't know if you have any closing thoughts. That's basically it for me. But, but do you find in your own life that this affects you or you adapt uh, what you do in into your own life. Is this Quran uh, project of yours um, have an adaptation to you? Oh, uh, thank you for that question. And the the answer is the answer is yes, yes, yes. Iowa, Iowa, Iowa. To use Arabic as well as English. I mean the the um, you know I, as I said I, I'm I'm a Christian. I'm not a I'm not a, a Muslim. I think I'm uh, I'm what people would think is an oxymoron. I'm, I'm a devout Episcopalian. Um, but one of the things that I really enjoy in my own meditative life is reflecting on the names of God, the Asma al Husna, as they're called in Arabic. But also, since I've read Birik, I must say it's, it's not only those two weeks where I just immersed in the book, but what changes the way in which he does what some Muslims have done through the century is to say the Quran is important, not just because it's these 114 chapters, and I completely agree with David that you might have to think very hard about whether what we have is absolutely what was revealed to the prophet Muhammad by the Archangel Gabriel, but there's enough of a distillation of it that I think the question of whether it's a perfect replication or not is secondary to the fact that whatever survived has great value, tremendous value. And Birk has done something which I have never seen done in any other form. He's picked out verses which are almost like ethical mandates. They're kind of like pithy distillations of the whole message of the Quran, and he's put them in the form of a metab. Mehrab is a place that you find in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in a mosque, and he's made this mehrab out of an ATM machine. Now, you, you might say, oh, that's really profane. I mean, that is just crossing the line. I can't imagine what a Saudi reviewer of this book would do. I don't think that it'll happen, but if a Saudi reviewer came as far as the last chapter and read that there was a California artist who was somewhere between an agnostic and atheist, and he did the whole of the Quran and then portrayed some of it with an ATM machine, um, they might even burn the book. I mean, seriously, they would think this is just total heresy, but I think it is over-the-top, beautiful reflection in American idiom of what the Quran's all about. So he does this mihrab where he has on one side from the Quran, always be just. They're all dicta, always be just. And then it has on the right side, be true to every promise. And then it has on the left, be modest in your bearing. And then I have to say, I've recently been ill with cancer, and when I was ill with cancer, I used this verse, and it gave me great comfort, which was from the 94th chapter, the 5th and 6th verses, truly with hardship comes ease. Truly with hardship comes ease. And it's one of those messages that when you're ill, it just helps you focus on what is really important in life. And 
I think Sandow Birk did it better than almost anybody I can imagine. So yes, I have used him, and I really appreciate everything that went into this. It went, by the way, it took him over 10 years, and he I never met him, but when I finally got to talk to him, he said, you know, there were points when I just about gave up. I thought, nobody's going to care about what I'm doing with the Quran, but I have to do it because it is a life's work that has elevated me. So I'm glad he persisted. I think that his book is is too big for most people to carry and maybe you know too hefty for some people to even consider buying but i think for our, everybody gets a chance to look at the at the at the quran and to read sandow Birk american quran will be elevated by it that's bruce b lawrence he is the nancy and jeffrey marcus humanities professor emeritus of religion at duke university his many books include who is allah and Shattering the Myth, Islam Beyond Violence. He's also the author of the new book, The Quran in English, a biography, part of Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Books series. And we also spoke today with Dr. David D. Peck, visiting scholar at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. He specializes in the history of the Middle East and Islamic civilization. Really quick question at the very end. If people are interested in reading an English translation of the Quran, which one would you recommend if they're looking to get that poetry and also just a good, like, what's the best, I guess, maybe even devotional English translation? Which one would uh, each of you recommend? Wow. I, I would love to hear David's uh, commentary on that. And I guess, you know, m mine would be to say that you, uh, if it's devotional, and I really appreciate, uh, Blair, you asking the question devotional. For, for devotional, I, I would say, that they're two very different ones that each of which can be satisfying but in a very different way if they want something where there is sort of this sense of if you will the kind of uh, open expansive nature of, of the quran as as a devout book which i think it, it has to be in english if it's going to render the arab i would say cleary either his first book the essential quran or his full translation the quran to me and i must say also to many of my muslim friends whom i've met and ask the same question you asked me. They say if it's somebody who doesn't want to read Arabic or can't read Arabic or wants an English standalone apart from the Arabic, the Cleary, the essential Quran or the Quran is the best. But then they quickly add, and I would agree with them, that either Abdul Halim, the, the Muhammad Abdul Halim who did the Quran for Oxford University Press, has the one that's sort of closest to reflecting the meaning of the Arabic but without the poetry. And if you want something between Abdul Halim and Cleary, then I would say something that doesn't give you poetry, but gives you very resonant prose and does a very nice job of packaging the whole of the Quran. I would recommend uh, Wahiduddin Khan. It, it, it's called Good Work Books. I, I talk about it in my book. Uh, he's a very elderly man now. He's in his 90s. I got my own copy of this when I actually was in Istanbul. They handed it out to me at, at, a, at a mosque, which I attended in Istanbul in English translation, and it's a beautiful, beautiful, accessible, pocket-sized Quran called, simply called the Quran, and it's Mohiduddin Khan translation. So those are my three. The top one, if you only have one, would be Cleary. If you want to be able to um, use a, a little bit more than Cleary, try Abdul Halim, which is, is, is not poetry, but it gives you the meaning of it. If you want something between poetry and prose that I think still is very, very accessible and for devotional purposes, very useful, I carry it when I go on a trip, is Wahiduddin Khan, simply called the Quran. And people can check out the transcript of this episode for the spelling of those if they're unsure. Uh, all right, Dr. Peck, how about you? Well, you know, I would agree with the Cleary. And uh, there's so many different ones that I enjoy because each time I read them, something new pokes out because of the way they've translated it. So, I mean, there's, there's all of those. But uh, if I were to look for clarity, I, I agree on everything you said. I would add the study Quran myself. And the reason is, is because I tend to relate to Sufis really well. You can probably tell that from my work and, and our interview here today. And, and so uh, Syed Hussein Nasser himself, you know, an advocate of Sufism and a Sufi, uh, in providing his commentary, always make sure that there's an esoteric interpretation, you know, thrown in whenever he can do it. So you get both the literalism and you get sort of this sense of, of esotericism and a sense of uh, morality. How does this book apply to me? You know, so um, the one thing I like, that's one th reason why I like to study Quran as well. And if you're like me, reading the Quran, I believe, has made me a better Mormon. Uh, in other words, this, this engagement has been 
enriching to my own religious life and and I, I, from what I'm hearing from you Bruce this is this is enriching to your own spiritual and perhaps even perhaps even like me being a better Mormon you're a better Episcopalian I don't know I hope so but uh, but at any rate it's been a it's been a pleasure to to talk to you and recommend these these Qurans well I totally agree with you and that's one of the things that I really treasure about uh, Mormonism the Mormon tradition uh, we, we didn't even talk about the parallels but they're so amazing that I mean the notion of, of, of an angel appearing a, to a prophet and doing it, and I, I, and I, I must say, uh, you know, one a couple times I've taken. Um, this is just a, 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 a small joke at the end. You may want to edit it out, but I have to tell you this: that when I, back in 1981, 1981, I'm that old. I was taking a bunch of uh, Muslim visitors for the State Department around, and we got to Oakland, California. They said you've you've got to go to, uh, maybe one or both of you have been to um, the, the the wonderful um, Mormon temple there in Oakland. And, and we went there, and I had somebody who was representing uh, the Mormon tradition in perfect Arabic get up and say, you know, Mormons and Muslims, we all are alike. We have uh, prophecy that came through an angel. We have a book that was came down revealed, and it's been preserved in its revealed state. And the only thing we, we, we differ on is this slight business when you say the Shahada is la ilaha uh, well, Yusuf Rasulullah. <laughs> That's a great anecdote. You're going to have to translate that. Yusuf is pet. Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's no yeah, God yeah, but yeah. God I mean, and, and Joseph. But Joseph, and Joseph Smith. is his prophet. Yeah, Joseph is his prophet. That's what he's saying. That Joseph is his Instead messenger. Of, yeah, Allah so, is God. Yeah, there is no, there is no is God but prophet. Allah. And, yeah, yeah. And Joseph, and Joseph is his messenger. Muhammad, it's yeah. a beautiful. And I've had that experience so many times. I have to agree with you. Uh, inshallah, Bruce, we will meet in this life. Uh, God, that means God willing, right? Inshallah. Uh, all of willing will meet in this life. Uh, I feel like I have come to know you and I deeply respect uh, your work and the sincerity and the spirituality and the enthusiasm that you bring to it. Thank you. Well, thank you. I feel that I've heard an echo of my own voice at its best in, in this interview today. Thank you very, very much, both of you. Thank you. We appreciate you taking the time, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.